All right, thank you for that warm uh, welcome. Um, I'm gonna talk to you guys today about BPH. I think I'm in the right room, like everybody here is a urology nurse, right? Okay, so we know what BPH is, we don't. All right, so the prostate is the organ that I believe uh, God made special for the urologist because <laughs> every man alive, at some point, they're gonna meet a guy like me. And um, sometimes it's a pleasant experience, other times it's not. And you know, we have the handshake, we get to that at some point. But uh, what the, every man, always, people always ask, what's the job of the prostate? Well, the prostate is responsible for making some enzymes that help the sperm survive its journey to fertilize the egg, okay? And connected to the prostate is the vas as well as the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle is where the majority of the volume the man ejaculates from comes out from. The reason I'm going through this is that some, when we talk about diseases that affect the prostate, some of these things are some of the side effects or things that will be affected based on the treatments that we give. So the gland has both a uh, glandular tissue as well as a fibromuscular tissue. When patients say I have a big prostate, it's not that the gland, that when you look at the prostate gland, that you have multiplication of the gland. It's actually more that the cells are swollen, they're bigger. And when they're bigger, they cause the issues uh, of, uh, of obstruction, depending on where that is. Um, as opposed to cancer, where the cells are dividing, and they just don't get that message to stop dividing, okay? So a normal prostate, when the blood is ready to, to work, when the blood is full and you want to urinate, I noticed there's not a whole lot of men in this room, but you guys can take the message home to your patients and family members that are affected, but uh, when a man goes to urinate, you know, the first thing that usually happens is the bladder gives the sensation, I'm full, I wanna go. And you, the man then has to relax the, the uh, external sphincter, and sometimes we do help by, you know, initiating voiding with our abdomen. And that is what kicks in into the neck of the bladder opening, as well as the prostate opening for the urine to flow out, okay? Um, in somebody with BPH, as you can see, the difference between this picture and this is that here in the central zone, like in the middle where the prostatic urethra is, there is swelling that's now obstructing the flow of the urine. So if you understand this picture, when you see this picture and you see the side effects, or not the side effects, but the symptoms that the patient comes in with, it makes sense. So the, what causes BPH? You know, it's part of getting old, basically. Um, you know, 20 year old man walks in and, you know, is complaining of BPH like symptoms. Do they have BPH? The answer is no. Uh, more than likely, what they have is prostatitis or some other issue going on. Um, so, BPH cannot be prevented, it can be treated. There's some men that are lucky, they go through life and they never see a guy like me. Uh, but, for majority, when they get older, the uh, BPH kicks in and you know, they come in to see us. And what are those obstructive symptoms? Some of them are, you know, the guy, you know, you, you, they tell you they go to urinate and they start and all of a sudden they, they're, they're done, but they feel like they're not completely done because there's still something left in there. Um, sometimes they go to the bathroom and it's drip, 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 and nothing you know, flows out. The stream is weak, uh, they strain, um, they have this start and stop where they pee some and then they, you know, they stop and then they have to keep waiting and waiting until all of it comes out. And usually you, you ask them, you know, what, what does it feel like? Do other people come and leave while you're still there? And they're like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. That's, you know, signs of BPH. The other things that happen with BPH, which kind of, if you're not very experienced, you might wonder that, you start thinking they have overactive bladder, is that they tell you, I go a lot. You know, but the way the patient understands it is they see it as every single time I get somewhere, I'm looking for a bathroom. And the reason they're looking for a bathroom is for the you know, number one reason there. They're never completely empty. You know? So it doesn't take very much for them to fill their bladder back up. So they're always going. That's the reason for the frequency and the urgency. And then the burning is more of an irritative uh, symptom. Sometimes having incomplete bladder emptying can cause you to have a UTI, which again uh, will cause burning. Um, so, on a physical examination, when you see a patient, 
uh, that has BPH, uh, if they have a suprapubic uh, bladder distension, that's a bad sign because what that's telling you is that no matter what they do, they never get the urine completely empty out of their bladder. They're the guy who, you know, on ultrasound, bladder scan, they are measuring anywhere from, you know, 500 cc, and you're like, did you go? They're like, yeah, I, I got all of it out. Like, but you still have a bladder that's super full. And they're looking at you wondering, what are you talking about? But this is the reason. Uh, DRE, all right, this is a poll in the room. Does the size of the prostate matter? in terms of BPH? Yes or no? How many people say yes? Put your hands up. All right, when they're up, mm, I got two. So what matters is not really the size of the prostate, it's actually the, 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 centri the, the prostatic urethra, which is the middle portion of the prostate where the, the urine flows through. You can see a man that has a huge prostate. I mean, when I talk about huge, the one that even make me scream like, are you okay? <laughs> and you ask them, do you have any problem urinating? Nope. You do a bladder scan, empty. And the size of the prostate is 100 or you know, sometimes 200 grams. I mean, I'm talking about prostate that sometimes you can actually, if you do it, we don't usually do bimanual exam on men, but if you were to do one, you actually feel it. Um, so the size, a lot of patients will come in and say, is my prostate big? I was telling them, yeah, this is kind of like your height. Whatever it is, you know, there's not a normal height. You could be tall, you could be short, but you're still you, you know. So, um, is there any lab you get? Uh, the, when we start getting labs in BPH, it's kind of when things are kind of getting bad. For example, when creatinine starts to go up, um, you know, you're, you're having repeated urine uh, infections and, and things like that. It's because basically you're heading towards uh, uh, the, the end. And I always tell patients, you want to intervene before things get real bad. They're like, oh, but I have no problems. Well, not now. Maybe two years from now you will. Uh, what are the tests we do in the office? The Euroflow uh, post void residual with a bladder scanner. When we start getting the kidney or bladder ultrasound, that's, again, towards you're having end organ damage, which is bad. Uh, trust biopsy we get um, in a patient whose PSA is elevated. So whenever you, you see a patient for BPH, you know, there's the handshake. Most patients are like, we just met. I'm like, I know, but sorry. And I got big fingers too, so. But uh, so you have to, this is, a, this is very important. There's a lot of men that come in with BPH symptoms. When you do a good exam, you're gonna pick up, you know, some that have a nodule. Um, it's always, in my opinion, good to get a PSA. If the nodule is there or you have a PSA that's high, um, you want to work them up for prostate cancer and the you know, we've all seen this where we have to do a prostate biopsy with the ultrasound probe and, and the needle and, you know, do all that. The reason is because if you find BP, if you find cancer, the treatment changes because now you have to treat, you have to remove, either think about removing the entire prostate gland or radiating the prostate depending on the stage of the cancer or what, or what have you, um, instead of just trying to open up the prostate for them to urinate. You might still have to do some things. If a patient says, I don't want to have surgery, but I want to have radiation, you may still need to do procedures to open them up before uh, treating their cancer. So what are the things to do when the patient has BPH? You can either watch, and majority, you know, we've all seen those patients that come in, their bladder scan is 300, I'm fine. I don't want medications, I don't want anything. You know? So some people just wait. Um, others want to get medications. Some uh, would want you to do procedures that would guarantee them that this is never going to come back. And the reason I think God is a urologist is this, does the prostate regrow? Yes or no? Yeah. Exactly. Prostate does regrow. So even if you shave it down, five to ten years later, it can come back. So whenever you talk to patients about this, let them know you know, what we're doing is we're trying to make sure like in the next five years, at least five years, that you're going to be better, but we may have to repeat what we're doing in about, you know, five to ten years. It's not everybody that it happens on. Not everybody. Some people it will. And then surgery. So the bedrock of treatment is uh, using alpha blockers, and what alpha blockers are, are, you know, the medications we give to relax not just the prostatic urethra, but also the neck of the bladder. And the reason is because that area is where 
we have the alpha receptors that are responsible for causing relaxation of the bladder neck as well as the prostate and for you to be able to urinate. And the type, uh, type 1A ones are the ones that, uh, that are good because they're very uh, specific to this area. So kind of a picture showing what I just said. Um, so, and the prostate is a, is a gland that is very sensitive to hormonal manipulation. Kind of the reason why it is the bedrock, or, or part of the treatment of prostate cancer is to try to manipulate the hormones, um, to try to block uh, testosterone and what, what have you um, in order to, when you're treating cancer, when you're treating BPH, you can do the same thing. Um, because the uh, 5 alpha reductase uh, enzymes are the ones that we try to manipulate when we treat BPH. So alpha blockers, these are the old guys, you know. Anybody here work at the VA? You did? Which one do they love at the VA? It's usually terazosin and doxazosin. I think they have stock in this thing because everybody at the VA is always on hytrin, which is terazosin, or doxazosin which is Kadrura. Um, the newer agents, and these ones are the ones that are sensitive, that have the type uh, alpha 1B receptor sensitivity much, much better than these guys. With those ones, you have to worry about the side effects. We'll talk about it in the next slide. Um, as a disclaimer, I prescribe a lot of Rapaflow, and because I don't like seeing people back for the same thing all the time. Great drug, works very well. Uh, Flomax. When I don't know what really happened with Flomax. Before it was good, now it's kind of like iffy. There's a lot of generic companies that make them, and sometimes you get the good ones, sometimes you get the bad ones. So, so this is Rapaflow, uh, Flomax, and Uroxitrol. These are the, uh, the, the specific type 1A uh, receptor blockers. And these are the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. The older one is the Proscar. Anybody know what else this drug is used for? Exactly. So those, those guys that w don't want to go bald, they use this too. Avidart is the newer one. Um, so what is, what's the advantage of medications? They're convenient. You just, as long as you remember to take your pill, you know, majority, for majority of, of those people who are on medications, that's all they probably need. Um, but again, 30% of men who are getting medication treatment for, pro for BPH will still progress. So. Um, and the, the risk of medication, using the medication is pretty minimal. The disadvantage, costs money, sometimes insurance change, coverage plans change, um, you know, uh, drug interactions, uh, you have to take it every day. And in terms of treatment, you're just, you know, managing the problem instead of fixing what the problem is, okay? Number one reason a lot of dudes don't like taking medication, retrograde ejaculation. They come in, they're like, thought. It's like nothing is coming out. And we go back to the picture, I pull up the picture, I explain to them why that happens. And the reason you get retrograde ejaculation is that the bladder neck, if you remember the picture I showed you, I showed the bladder neck as well as the prostatic urethra being where the alpha receptors are, when you, re when you block those very well, when the man ejaculates, is a less distance to go from the prostate into the bladder than to go from the prostate to the tip of the penis. So everything just goes into the bladder. The next question I get is, is that gonna hurt me? I'm like, no, it came from you. How's it gonna hurt you? But again, you know, most patients, they're, they worry. So, um, so when you get that question, just know uh, what to tell them. Impotence, uh, the Proscar and Avidar can cause uh, some men to get impotence. Again, the older drugs can cause uh, dizziness, headaches, loss of sexual drive is uh, the Proscar and the Avidar fatigue, and then hypotension. So now surgery. Who should get surgery? If a guy walks in and they're in retention, you give them a voiding trial, give them medication, and they fail, they should start thinking about having procedures done. A guy who has recurrent hematuria because their prostate is so big, they're kissing each other when you do a cysto, and it's a friable prostate, and every single time they pee, the urine goes through, and you know things just get irritated, and it, they keep bleeding and coming back, they should get surgery. Recurrent urinary tract infection. If you're starting to affect your upper tracts, your kidneys, it's time to get surgery. At least you wanna, make, you wanna stop the, you're not gonna reverse the injury to the kidney, but at least you're gonna stop it. Um, one thing that is not here is bladder stones. Whenever I see a patient with a bladder stone, surgery. 
Um, if you fill med medications, like we talked about before, there are people who basically the insurance will cover surgery, but they won't cover medications. It does happen. So this picture kind of shows you the prostate as you're coming in. In a man with, this is not bad. This is kind of moderate BPH. Uh, there's some that you cut, like when you're coming in, it's basically your scope literally has to force its way in. Um, and then after we shaved them down, and this was a green light, uh, it looks like, you know, you're staring into the abyss, but it's wide open. Um, there are other options outside of surgery, like uh, intraprostatic stents. Uh, tuna, microwave, Eurolift, and Resume are the newer uh, options that are great. Um, and uh, TERP, how many people work with doctors that still do like old-fashioned TERP? Okay. Good. Wow, you guys are all in the back. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, then green light laser. Uh, here you can also add um, the homeum laser, the, you know, whole lap. Um, I don't do whole lap. It's basically because I did them in the beginning and it just was not as good as a green light, in my opinion. Um, and then simple... Uh, Superfibic prostatectomy, you can do it open or robotic. So, prostatic, uh, intraprostatic stent. Anybody ever seen this before? What was your experience? Do you guys like them? It was at the University of Minnesota when they first started. Uh -huh. They must have made an article on Time Magazine, so everybody and their grandfather would come to the University of Minnesota. I mean, I, mean, I think we were probably one of the first places that did it, so uh -huh. the success rate, maybe it was lack of experience putting them in, but they didn't, they weren't spectacular. Yeah. So overall, a lot of the prosthetic stents um, ended up being removed. And the reason was because there was a lot of things that went with it. When you put a stent in or any foreign material in the urinary tract that's supposed to stay there permanently, the, what, what usually happens to ureteral stents when you live it in for a long time? They get encrusted. And the prostate can also grow into the stents too, because remember the prostate can grow. The body knows this is not normal, it shouldn't be here, and it's gonna try to like either push it out or wall it off or do something. So when I was in residency, we removed a few of these, and I don't wanna ever do that again. <laughs> it was not easy. So this, it, a lot of ingrowth. Chinese pull, you know, one of those things you put on your finger and you pull and <laughs> it makes it tighter. Yeah. So, um, so, this kind of fell out of favor because of that. Um, whenever you see procedures like doctors don't do, there's a reason why. Probably because we don't like the side effects that it gives. Uh, tuna is, uh, is using uh, microwave therapy, uh, radio frequency ablation. Um, the problem with this was that you have to do this like almost every six months. It wasn't really very durable, this and this. And for a guy who's 90, who's not in good health, and medications cause like, you know, severe symptoms. Um, sometimes, you know, you could do it on patients who are on blood thinners, because this one, you just put a catheter in and warm it up a little bit and just have the tissue that is pretty adjacent to this die and open up just a little bit enough for them to get some relief. Um, but in terms of durability, you know, a lot of patients don't want to, I mean, doctors don't want to see patients every day. They'll see the same guy for the same thing. It's like, what am I doing here? Um, so it's, it kind of fell out of favor. I, in my practice, I rarely do this. Actually, I sent it to one of my partners, and he even doesn't like to do it. But in some people, this, is, this might be all you can do, okay? Now we come to the brand new things. Um, I'm not a paid uh, person to speak for Eurolift, um, but it's a procedure that is new but works. And what nothing makes doctors and patients as happy as yesterday I have problems and today I'm great. So what your lift is is basically you're using titanium clips uh, that you use to basically pry the prostate open. And the clips are self-retaining. Um, you push it to the capsule on the outside here and then push into the prostate to fire the second clip. And that basically keeps the prostate open physically and just holds it open, okay? Now, in this picture, there's a little bit that is missing um, in this demo. You try not to do this close to the bladder neck 
And the reason is because, you guys remember the number one reason men don't like taking uh, BPH medications, the retrograde ejaculation. So you want to do it here so that the bladder neck still stays closed. So that way, when they do ejaculate, they still shoot forward and they don't have the retrograde ejaculation. Um, the number of clips you put in depends on the size of the prostate. Um, usually uh, anywhere from two to six, uh, sorry, from, uh, yeah, two to six, depending on how big the prostate is. Uh, this is a little video here. This is from the company, this is not me, okay? Urinary symptoms and improved quality of life for men with an enlarged prostate caused by benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. As the prostate becomes enlarged due to BPH, it presses on the urethra from the outside and causes it to become blocked. Relieving obstruction of the prostate is clinically proven to improve urinary symptoms in men. Okay, keep going. Through a fine 19 gauge needle, an implant is deployed that holds the prostate in this new system is designed to offer a new way to relieve prostatic obstruction without cutting, heating, or removal of tissue. Next, the same technique is applied to the other side of the prostate. Because the outer capsule of the prostate is typically firm, it holds the urethra open. The number of implants required depends on the size of the prostate and the degree of obstruction. Typically, four to five implants are used. Before applying the urolift system, the urethra is blocked due to an enlarged prostate pressing on it from the outside. After applying the urolift system, the prostate lobes are pushed aside, leaving an open urethra. So, with, with the urolift, what you're doing is basically physically prying the prostate open. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's a new procedure that a lot of your office is doing, and a lot of people are very happy with the patients and the doctors. Um, just like every procedure, time will tell, okay? Uh, meaning, uh, you know, the next five, ten years in terms of durability. And this is, and I'm pretty open with patients, I tell them up front. You know, it's a procedure we know that we can get your system relief immediately. We don't burn any bridges. If we do that procedure and it doesn't work, we don't have to worry about that titanium clip. When we, if we decide to do a different type of procedure, we can actually go and do whatever we have to do despite the clip being in there. Okay, it's not going to affect anything that we do. Um, but but both, both the doctors, doctors at this point, point um, the, the company has data as to how effective it is. I, you know, I believe company data, but I also want my own data. So it's kind of like we're in the middle of doing the procedures, time will tell us uh, before you know, I can definitively say yes, whatever the company says is verified. Um, but, but it's a very good procedure in terms of getting patients, especially people who come in with urinary retention, you do it, you know, a day with the catheter, the next day you move it and they're urinating and they're happy and the doctor is happy. So. The second, the second procedure, procedure is our uh, resume. resume. What resume, resume is, is basically using radio frequency thermal energy, and you're using the convective uh, power of steam. Basically, you're using water, okay, to inject it directly into the prostate, and then that causes the prostate over time to die. The difference between your left and resume, your left, the next day the is great. Resume is a waiting period. You have, you have to, to wait, wait for the tissue to die, and then, and then for that, that opening to develop, well. for you to get relief. So it takes about, in some people, some people anywhere, anywhere from a month, month to up to three months. Okay. So, so this we use kind of show natural you natural energy stored in water vapor, or steam. It is a safe and effective treatment available to relieve symptoms associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. During each nine second treatment, Sterile water vapor is released throughout the targeted prostate tissue. When the steam turns back into water... I think this thing does it at uh, this... Uh, Overhealing response removes the dead cells, shrinking the prostate. With the extra tissue removed, the urethra opens, reducing BPH symptoms. Most patients begin to experience symptom relief in as soon as two weeks, and maximum benefit will occur within three months. Okay, so... So kind of like um, Eurolift, when we do resume, 
we try not to inject anywhere close to the bladder neck. You actually go about a centimeter or at least a centimeter away from the bladder neck before you start injecting. Same, same principle, which is you do not want to affect the neck of the bladder so that, you know, we don't want to do the procedure and the patient comes back and say, there's no difference between me taking medications and, uh, and having this procedure. Um, so we try to maintain the, the uh, integrity of the bladder neck, and that way they can still ejaculate forward. As you can see, it's a big theme. I know it's a room full of women, but a lot of guys come in with that simple complaint. You will not believe how much that worries a lot of people. So, All right, so the good old TERP. Um, basically, TERP is using electrical current and just basically manually shaving down the prostate. Like I tell patients, is like think of an apple, a little plum, and you go through the middle and you just core it out. Okay, that's really what TERP is. So you're creating a big physical opening um, for the patient, and this is kind of like a little schematic of it. So this picture um, shows you basically like you know what you do is you core out a big gigantic opening in the middle, and that way the patient has literally no obstruction in terms of to urination. Downside, as we're doing this, the, the neck of the bladder, this picture minimizes it, but the neck of the bladder is also basically gone. So that internal sphincter that you have in the neck of the bladder, we shave through that too, okay? So when we do this procedure or any other surgery procedure, retrograde ejaculation is permanent. It's not gonna come back, you can't reverse it. Um, so problem with TERP, it was, it's the gold standard um, still the gold standard. Even all the fancy stuff we do, this is still the big daddy. If you do this to any man, well, that's, uh, let me know. This is still good. Like, superpedic prostatectomy is the big daddy. That one fixes everybody. Um, but again, why, do we, why are we looking for other options? Because these are very invasive. It's, even though we do it endoscopically, patients are going to be in the hospital for a few days on CBI, Sometimes getting blood transfusions, um, you know, there's a TWA syndrome that you have to worry about and whatnot. Um, so what are the benefits? Patients, everything gets compared to a TERP. So all these procedures we do, be it a Eurolift, Resume, green light laser, and the reason is because we have the data from TERP. We've been doing TERP for, for years, like more than God knows how long, you know, like since we started using resectoscopes. Um, so TERP is durable. It's been proven to be very effective and very long-lasting. Um, but once, uh, what are the disadvantages? People die from this procedure. At least when I was in residency, you have to watch for TUR syndrome. You have to watch, you know, for people bleeding out. Um, sometimes DIC because of the amount of bleeding that, that goes on. You're in the hospital. You know, the one-day thing is, is more like two to four days. Um, and, you know, TERP syndrome, and then being with the catheter for a very long time. And then there's a risk of impotence, incontinence, reason. Uh, let me see if I can go back. When you're shaving uh, in very not experienced hands, you know, sometimes it's, my old chairman used to say, like, a TERP is like eating potato chips. It's like you keep cutting, it feels great because you're just shaving all this thing out. And sometimes you just kind of forget where you are at. And you can actually cut the sphincter. Remember, you, you're already going to cut this one, right? This is guaranteed. It's going to get cut. You, might, you, event, you can actually cut the external sphincter and not realize it. So it's a, it's a very, uh, incontinence is a real risk, OK? In a lot of men, they, sometimes people get incontinence not because of the sphincter getting cut, but because the ob obstructive prostate is kind of what's been keeping them dry. And once you relieve that, now they have basically not that, you know, their sphincter, the external sphincter is weak, it's not very good, now they start leaking urine. So you also have to talk to patients about that. Now it comes to the green monster, uh, the green light laser. So green light laser got developed because of all the side effects of a TERP. All the issues with a TERP, you know, a lot of patients didn't want to have TERP done because of all the things that come with the TERP. And what they really wanted was, you know, is there a way I can have a procedure, maybe stay in the hospital one day or go home the same day or, you know, not get blood transfusions. That's where the green light. Or 
Prolap, or any other type of laser ablative technology comes in. I like green light. I train on the green light. I, and the reason I like the green light is because it doesn't matter how big a prostate is, you can, you, you can stage the procedure, but you can actually pretty much laser any prostate. Um, now this is a video from AMS about green light. insert the resector skull and everybody has their technique meaning the way that they shave the prostate um, I usually try to create a groove between like at 5 o'clock and at 7 o'clock right here and also right here and that usually just allows the, it's kind of like when you see the prostate you do the 5 and the 7 o'clock incision all the way down to the view and that basically opens up the neck of the bladder even wider, then I can get better flow. Then I will take off the medial lobe. Once you, open, you take off the medial lobe, then you can do the lateral lobes. Um, but the thing about the green light that is great is that you can do the exact same operation that you would have done with a turp with the green light um, and create a very wide opening. All these procedures, whenever you see this, they show you the picture that's kind of keeping the bladder neck intact. No, I won't do it. Once we do this, the blood neck, blood neck is gone, okay? But the advantage is just like, just, like, um, just like a terp, the green light would basically vaporize the tissue. The tissue is gone. You, you've taken it out. It's not going to cut. I mean, it can grow back. Now, what is the durability of a green light? I've had patients that, you know, I did how many years ago, and they, they still haven't needed a repeat procedure. And every time they come in for their yearly checkups, they're still fine. Can the prostate regrow? Yes. Uh, majority of the time, where most prostates will regrow is, you know, you can have the gland that you did grow back. But a lot of people are very scared of lasering anteriorly because there's not very much tissue anteriorly. When you do prostatectomies robotically like I do, you would actually realize that the amount of tissue on top is not very much. But sitting right on top is the DVC. And if you burn a hole into that, you're not going to stop that bleeding anytime soon. So a lot of people tend to leave that alone uh, because anteriorly the prostate is not very big and it's not going to cause that much of an obstruction anyway. But in some men, you will see it happen. Um, now to a procedure that how many people uh, work in a practice where they still do the simple prostatectomy? You guys know what this is? Yeah. Again, they're in the back, okay? Yeah, so in our, in our, in our group, uh, Dr. Dan Hoime, he was the, the last one that did this procedure. And this is, a, talk about a bloody procedure. This is one. Um, basically, you make the same incision that you will make to do a, a, a radical prostatectomy open, um, but instead of removing the entire prostate gland, you're going inside of the gland to shell out the nodule, okay? So um, it, it's, a, it's a procedure that basically that will remove almost 90% of whatever prostate tissue you have in there. It's not gonna remove the entire thing, um, but it's very, very bloody, just like the TERP. Um, but in terms of durability, most men that get this procedure never need anything done ever again, okay? Um, so because of that, because of the bloodiness, I didn't, you know, when you compare that procedure, you just compare it to a TERP, but you're going through the infraabdominal incision. Um, because it's very bloody, tough, we actually don't learn it. In residency, I think I did eight, okay? That's a dying procedure. Then I came into practice, and then Dan was doing it for a while, and when he retired, it vanished. We don't do that anymore. Um, but the one that I will still do if, you know, the patient is up for it is a robotic prostatectomy, simple prostatectomy. Um, by the way, these pictures are from the British Journal of Urology. If you guys ever subscribe to that, they have fantastic atlas. The Netter Atlas, they have a surgical atlas in every single journal on different topics. 
and they are fantastic. Unfortunately, I forgot to tag the little thing on the corner here. Anyway, but that's where the pictures are from. Um, so basically, you do it the same way that you would do uh, a radical prostatectomy, except the ports are the same, everything is the same. But if I was doing a radical prostatectomy, we usually start by either coming down here to the pouch of Douglas and dissecting out the seminal vesicle and the vas, and then dropping the bladder. This is the medial umbilical ligament on each side and the urecus, dropping down the bladder and then coming from the front. This time around, we incise the bladder, open up the bladder, put tacking suture, uh, sutures to keep it open, and then grab the Foley catheter. And you can see that loba, the prostate that is causing obstruction right there, just kind of you know, choking off that, bladder, that, that catheter. Um, and then <clears throat> either you pull the catheter back so you can see, and then you incise around where you see the nodule. This is the ureteral orifices. You can see the ureters here. And you just kind of incise that, take it around. And the advantage of the robot is that the pneumoperitoneum helps you a lot. So you can turn up the pneumo. You know, I usually start at 12 or 15. If it starts to bleed a lot, you can turn it up to 20. Because a lot of these things are, you know, the, the venous bleeders. The pneumo will hold them. But the arterial ones, they will pump. And you see them and just kind of cauterize them. Um, so basically, you shell out the, the entire prostate and just dissect all the way down until you get to the bottom. Once you get to the bottom, you just think you will see the urethra and then you just cut it off. Once you cut it off, you take that off and then you have to anastomose the posterior urethra to the posterior bladder neck because you still want to have a smooth, like if somebody was putting a catheter, you still want it to go smoothly uh, into, the, into the bladder. So you see the sutures here. So you kind of anastomose the posterior and then afterwards you close the bladder and you're done, okay? And that's my talk. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. One of the advantages of a chirp is, before they had ultrasound and prosthetic biopsies, you could do a chirp and then find out when the pathology looks at the shavings that they have. They have cancer, yeah. Yeah. So now you're going to do a simple prostatectomy. You used all the tests to make sure they didn't have. Oh well, that's the thing. Like if you remember in the beginning, I showed you guys kind of the workup. I like in my practice, whenever a man comes in, I actually screen him for prostate cancer, and if they meet the criteria for a biopsy, I'll do that first before we do anything else. Because if they have a huge prostate, they're going to probably have a high PSA. Yes. So if they have a big prostate. I would tell them, yeah, your PSA is high probably because of a big prostate, but I can't say that's the only reason. So if my index of suspicion is high, I would do a biopsy to document that I don't see any cancer before we then move forward to just treat the DPH. It's not, it's not, if you look at the AUA guidelines, you don't have to do that part. Actually, AUA guidelines just says basically they have obstructive symptoms. You can choose surgery right from the get-go. You can have surgery immediately. <laughs> Um, but it's just that even after you do say like a TURP or green light or whatever, you still follow them and screen them for prostate cancer. And if they do, I've done prostatectomy on patients that did green light and it still can be done. It doesn't preclude you from being able to do it. Is it easy? No. But with the robot, you can do it. So. Any other questions? Comments? Criticism? <laughs> <laughs>